Your podcast. We're excited. And I'm always excited because let me tell you something. We got some guests coming on that you need to hear from. And so every Thursday, you can find us here at 4 p.m. Central Time on the Black Podcast. Sometimes we occasionally have a, a show earlier or later, but we'll always let you know on our social media. Because we're already six minutes in, we want to make sure that we get all our time with our special guests today. Um, I don't know if they're ready, Brian, for our, for our guest today because he he's a... a such a powerful man. And so please make sure that you guys are doing your part in sharing the video. Make sure you're sharing right now on your page because you never know who's in your circle of influence that may need to hear the story of Dr. Mills that we have. And I've already spilled the beans of who we have on the show. But Brian, we're going to go ahead and get started and bring Mr. Mills in. You got a little delay here. Can you hear me? All right, <clears throat> so having a little bit of a glitch over here. Um, technology do that to you ever so often. But uh, like Dr. Hobson said, without further ado, we're not gonna waste any time. Um, you heard enough about myself, about her. We had to bring in the men of the hour. Dr. Mills, how's it going? It's going well. I'm glad to uh, be on the podcast with such esteemed our folks uh, to talk about you know, the thing that we care about most, education. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're just excited that you accepted the invite. We know that you're such a busy man and got a lot of roles and shoes to fill. So we appreciate you taking the time to be on the Black Podcast with us. Uh, we want to make sure that we dive right in and learn more about you. Um, we know that behind every glory, there's a story. And so we like to start off in the beginning with knowing a little bit more about you where you were born and kind of dynamics of your family so we can have a better understanding of why you're doing the things that you're doing right now. So if you can give us a little bit of that black story for us. Yeah, so uh, I come from very humble beginnings. Um, I'm from Patterson, New Jersey. It's the third largest city in New Jersey. Um, it is similar to any other urban city that is riddled with drugs, crime, you know, uh, all kinds of things that we're ultimately trying to fix. But um, it's where my story began. We grew up in the, the housing projects there. Uh, my mother had me when she was 16, had my sister when she was 17. Um, I have two other sisters outside of that. And, um, you know, we grew up and I was just kind of figuring it out. Uh, press a, a unique story, but I won't get into it. But I have a, a scar on my face. I don't know if you can see it, but I have 400 stitches in my face just really a byproduct of, of what I was coming up in and, and what we had to go through in order to survive. And so in getting through all of it, um, I managed to get through high school, playing ball, uh, went to college, got a degree in, in math education, a uh, bachelor's of science in math, start teaching at 22, uh, got my master's while teaching, became a math chairperson. So I was the youngest math chairperson in the city, potentially the state, um, at 25. I did that for a year before becoming a vice principal. Um, and then a year into the vice principal job, I actually got the principal job at 27 at the, um, at the time it was the worst high school in the city of Newark. And it was uh, the bottom 15% in the country. Uh, and so probably be, not because I was just like this amazing administrator, but it was like, who else going to take it? Uh, the community believes he's the guy. The alumni believe he's the guy. The kids are saying he's the guy. He's young. Let's let him get in there, fail, and see what happens. Uh, and that just wasn't the story. We ended up turning school around 180 days. Uh, we doubled the literacy scores in one school year. And uh, that's where all the, the cameras start coming because people wanted to know how we did it. Because um, it wasn't just me. It was a group of folks, um, including the students. Um, that really made it all happen. So um, I'm proud of that. 
uh, end up leaving that uh, the district and retiring, like officially retiring from education at 33, um, closing out the pension, everything. Uh, went and worked for a nonprofit, um, a well-funded nonprofit by some of the wealthiest folks in the country. Got able to travel the country, work with principals, uh, about 50 principals, I'll say, 50 schools across uh, seven different states, eight different cities. Uh, and while doing that, I met my partner um, in the charter school work where we were able to co-found College of Chief Patterson, um, which is a, a district within a network of schools um, in New Jersey. And so that's what I'm currently doing outside of like books and so on and so forth that we'll get in. So I think that's the essentially the journey to, to who I am right now. Wow. Um, so when you talked about, if you can just maybe elaborate more on how it was growing up where, yeah. um, you know, being that your mother was so young and you're going through the system and you're going through education. Um, one thing that I learned, especially throughout my career as an educator, also as a coach or just being an athlete, period, is that a lot of our young men, they join athletics because of either financial situations or just trying to get out of their situation or, you know, want something productive to do. Um, so sports usually was that vehicle yeah. for a lot of our young black males. Um, if you can just talk about kind of that transition of, hey, this is my situation, but then joining a sport, like what was it about being a part of something that you felt you needed to do and not go the other way, maybe with your other uh, people that you grew up with that decided yeah. to do drugs and violence or whatever? How was that for you? Um, so strangely enough, sports was the excuse, right? Like we we, we, we lived in a housing project with four uh, tall buildings and, and three row buildings. And so we spent a lot of time in front of those buildings and in front of those buildings wasn't necessarily things that we would promote to other young people to participate in, right? We wouldn't say stand out here, we wouldn't say learn from the guys that are out there essentially being our role models because they had everything that we saw on TV. They had, you know, the women, they had the cars, they had the clothes, they had the jewelry, all the things that we felt like we need to have now at the age of 11 and 12 and 13. And so for me, getting into sports actually became uh, a great excuse to not have to be there because peer pressure is a real thing. And when you're trying to navigate the space, you find that you are very loyal to your friends and start to say yes to things that you don't necessarily agree with. And so what it did for me was it put me in a space where I can go to say to them like, hey, I'm gonna be at practice and then I'll have a game or what have you on a Saturday or Sunday and they will all show up to support me. So like the beauty of their belief in my ability to make it out a different way was definitely something that made me feel good. And also for them, made me feel like, you know, these are true friends, these are people are supporting me and they're not ultimately pulling me into whatever they're doing. Um, and so that was good. But had I not had sports, I would say, you know, my hour in front of a building would have probably turn to three, four or five hours. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I myself would have started making choices that were probably not in the best interest of my future even if they weren't pushing it on me, I would have been seeing what they were getting from it, the benefits, and it probably wouldn't have outweighed the, the bad. But, um, you know, when you're 15, when you're 16, you know, it all looks good no matter what the risk is. Right. Yeah, so. You don't see the big yeah. picture at that time. Exactly. Wow. So how was like how was your the support from your mother during that time when you decided to go to sports? Because I know a lot of um, our parents didn't really grow up knowing, wasn't educated on, you know, scholarships and the type of opportunities that sports can, you know, provide besides making it to the NFL. You know, um, so if you can talk a little bit more about how that transition or that support was for you and then also maybe the support or what. What helped you through that transition in high school, being in sports? Like, were there coaches? Were there teachers? Yeah. You know, what was that moment experience like for you? So you, you're asking really good questions. <laughs> so, like, uh, in my book, I have the first chapter, two, eight, three. Maybe it goes literally through this. And so, um, for my mom, she wasn't aware of sports, as you just said, and she was just trying to survive and feed us. Right? She's like, I need to go to work. I need to figure this out. I need to make sure y'all eat. I need to make sure that. Y'all have Nike shoes so that you don't feel that you need to be in front of this building. 
uh, doing some inappropriate things. So sports was a thing that I was driving because I showed interest in it. What I could say uh, she made sure of was that whatever I showed interest in, she did her part to actually make it possible. So if I said that football was something that I wanted to do, she was going to get me there. She was going to sign whatever paperwork and she was going to put me with the coaches to make sure that I did it. And then if I said that I didn't want to do it anymore, she was like, nah, you have to do all of this stuff. So you're going to stay on that field and do what you got to do. You're going to finish the season. (laughs) Exactly. So even though she wasn't able to be at every game and and wasn't the mom at every practice saying, make sure you put my son in, she was the parent that made sure that I got started on the thing that I said I wanted to do. And she also made sure that I finished a thing that I started. And so that for me was really helpful because in that group of folks that she left me with, I've met lifelong mentors. I mean, I have coaches that, you know, literally say, hey, I'm going to give you a job. This job is going to pay you more than a traditional, you know, minimum wage job at your age. And then after you get off work, I'm going to drop you off home, shower, and then we're going to head straight to practice. That's Coach Sabota. That's my head football coach, you know, making sure – that I got what I needed and I, and I didn't go and do something that I wasn't supposed to do. And so those life lessons that I learned over sandwiches during lunch on a construction site is something that has stuck with me for a very long time. The opportunity to see what life is like for normal working people outside of the projects was eye opening because we thought we needed to jump straight to being millionaires. Right. We didn't understand that there's just regular people who are teachers actually own in very large homes in suburban cities in New Jersey, Mm -hmm. right? Like they have pools in their backyard and things like Mm -hmm. that. So those are all (laughs) inspiring opportunities just because I was working with him. Or, you know, Coach Prescott was was a person who was really, I looked at him as like a big brother. I mean, he, he had every lesson you could possibly think of ready to give us. And he was also a coach. And to this day, He's still a, a, a prominent mentor of mine, just really helping me navigate adulthood as a black man, right? Like he's lived it, he understands it, he's made good choices. And so I constantly lean on him when I can to, to, to just pitch things about how, how I'm going or what he thinks about this. Um, in a very crucial time in my life where I was probably making real poor decisions, uh, he was the person having a difficult conversation with me and it hurt. It hurt me, but at the end of the day, it helped get me to this space. Wow. This is my last question talking about, you know, a lot of what I see um, in education, I've been doing it for 16 years and now as an athletic coordinator. But one thing that I've always noticed is that you can always tell when you're dealing with these students or what type of kind of relationships that they have with their mother or their father, right? Um, And so being that your mother took on the role of being the provider, the protector, the whatever she needed to do. Do you feel like your relationship with it, was there ever a time like your relationship with the coaches where it was kind of like, you know, taking authority from a man, was that ever an issue because you, you know, you were used to speaking with your mother or was that something that you more gravitated towards having more like, did you look at them like father figures? Like how was that relationship or transition for you? being that these were your coaches and then you kind of had a single mother like what was that like for you yeah so it's a really good question um i feel like uh men no matter what age they are have pride right and sometimes when you don't learn how to deal with your pride and set it aside to get you know to reach a greater good you're going to have conflict and so when strong males understand how to deal with a prideful teenager we see progress Right. When prideful males don't know how to deal with a prideful teenager, we see a huge disconnect and a lot of anger. Right. And fighting. And so I was like just lucky enough to interact with men that could set their pride aside and see that I was dealing with an issue where I just wasn't ready to take orders from anyone that I had. a I had an opinion. You know, I had a thought. And I wanted to get my point across. And, you know, when you're dealing with the right kind of leader, they're like, you know, well, get that out. So then I can help you see how you just navigated yourself into a black hole. And then we can have a real conversation (laughs) about 
how you can actually do it right. And so that that's very true. You know, as I was navigating life, I did feel like, well, I'm the man in the house. I'm figuring out how to make money and working or doing stuff I probably shouldn't be doing. And no one should be telling me anything. But like you said, the right males, um, when my pride was in a way, they knew what to do, what to say, and what kind of relationships they needed to build with me to help me see, like, you going nowhere fast with that type of behavior and attitude. And I know that for some people, it's the trauma is so bar, so bad or severe that it's hard to break through. Um, I'm going to say, but luckily, um, they got me early enough for me to see by the time I got to high school, like, how I should really be interacting with a male that, that, that really has knowledge and, and, and skills to offer me to help me be be a better human being man i'm loving what i'm hearing man um i want to take it back to you made reference to the scar you have on your face um it's oftentimes that we want to present ourselves a certain way we want to be received a certain way but the pure fact of the matter is most people are going to draw up a conclusion on who you are or at least make a prediction of who you are based off what they see first yeah. so um taking your scar into consideration has there been dialogues that came from talking about what happened with that scar and being able to draw a connection to someone and the you know the younger population that you're working with to kind of let them know look i've experienced xyz kind of like what you were just mentioning okay i'm gonna let you run into the wall first but then I'm going to put you on game, let you know which direction you really need to go in. Have you had those types of interactions? And um, and, and what would you say has been um, what would you say has been some of the, the most profound um, opening ups or, or realizations that you've seen in some of the youth that you work with based off of a story around your scar? Yeah. yeah so so strangely, strangely enough, that's my secret sauce. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Not the scar so much, but like. I am from where they from. And so a quote that, uh, this is actually J. Cole lyric, and say I love hip hop. Like I'm, I'm, like he says, like I have to walk amongst the evil for the greater good of the people. And so, right, like I've lived that in a real way. I've survived it, I've navigated it. I understand, you know, how people are thinking about certain situations and what they're willing to do because of what they're going through, right? You don't understand why a person makes the choice until you see that their family can't eat right, or they can't eat themselves and they're just trying to survive and figure things out. And so I think like those experiences and having um, my youth and, and, and liking the things that teenagers like, right, they like nice cars, so do I, right? They like nice clothes, so do I. They like certain kinds of music, like Little Uzi Bird, like so do I, right? I'm not above those kinds of rappers is something I grew up on and I enjoy and I understand the difference between real life and entertainment. And that's something I educate them on. But uh, it's actually broke down so many barriers, just me being me, that people are willing to even approach me because they understand that he's not different than me. He's not acting like he's different than me. He may have, uh, he may be able to speak a certain way. He may be able to write or, or, or do math a certain way but you know what he's just like me and i embrace them in that way and i would say some of the most transformational leadership that i've experienced is to see young men right say i want to be a math teacher too mm -hmm. right i want to be a principal too and if there's one young man uh i can recall him saying that to me in his sophomore year in high school at shabazz and him saying that he wants to go to Montclair State University, which is the university I went to, right? Him doing those things, graduating and currently being a teacher with the intent to be more than just a teacher. Mm -hmm. What makes that story so amazing is he hasn't lost sight of himself. So I see him on social media, we follow each other. He's a fly young kid. Mm -hmm. I love it though, because he's making being educated cool. Right. And, and that's what has to happen amongst our communities, because sometimes we stray away from it because we don't think like it's cool enough. It's not acceptable and it's not something we should be. Right. But when you understand the power of being able to like read and comprehend a thing and then respond appropriately to it, 
that could literally be a grant application that Absolutely. brings a million dollars into your organization. Yeah. That's cool. Right. <laughs> How cooler can it get? But we have to, we have to like help people understand that I'm I'm not a robot and I don't have to fit a certain type of mold to get mm -hmm. to where I'm at. Absolutely. And I think that that for me has been the most impactful of just like being my 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 authentic self mm -hmm. as often as I possibly can. Wow. Yeah. And that's that's big because, you know, a portion of what we do with with our company is help build those relevant relationships, which, you know, this is what one of those would be. And we titled this this uh, this episode Relevant Education because you can relate to these guys and yeah. the fact that you can relate, it makes it so much easier to change that situation, because, like you said, I kind of related to. Um, I was living in Miami, Florida after I finished my graduate degree or my undergraduate. And then I came back to Mississippi to work on my master's. And the second semester I was here, I started um, speaking at the local juvenile detention center. And I remember going out and I watched a speaker present the day before I was going to speak with the guys. And they come with their expert hat on. I'm going to tell you X, Y, Z. Once I finish this, I'm gone. So I'm going to drill this into you. I'm going to talk at you on these points because I'm the expert and you got to listen to me and then I'm out of here. I saw that over and over. So when I went in, I kind of kicked back and you know, just folded my arms nice and relaxed. And they're like, so what you going to talk to us about? What y'all want to talk about? And when they saw my relaxed posture, it allowed them to relax a little bit. Yeah. Now, you know, they have some, 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 some barriers, some borders that I still had to work through but it allowed them to be a lot more real with me because yep. I was real with them. And that's one thing as, as professionals, especially when we get a couple of different degrees, we get all these different credentials. We can't let that go to our head and exactly. allow us to position ourselves on a totem pole to where these kids don't feel like we can be relatable. Uh -huh. So I love the fact that you come from that perspective mm -hmm. and the fact that you're younger, you literally are a whole lot more relatable than if someone up in their 40s and 50s come in trying to do the exact same thing that you're doing. Right. So I just think that's just so important, man. Um, and on that front, what do you, um, I'm gonna kind of gonna give you a, I guess kind of make you work a little bit. Okay. So 10 years down the road, 10 years down the road, you've done so much at such a young age, 10 years down the road, where do you see yourself as it relates to what you're doing right now? So uh, 10 years down the road for me is it, it should look like that you have had a hundred more podcasts with guests that look like me or are similar to me because I've influenced them to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Like that's what it should look like. I should be trying to find the next meet. I should be giving that person the same kind of access that I had. I should be working with them to pull them up and saying, hey, here's the way it goes. So that thing that you were trying to do, let's cut the timeline down from a five year plan to a two year plan because I already know how to do it. So my ultimate goal would be to create and or support thousands of and, and influence thousands and thousands of people that are trying to do this kind of work. And even if it's not an education, just trying to literally level themselves up and really like get to the dream that they've been pursuing for years to come because it's the only way that we can ultimately magnify our influence is to create a legacy, mm -hmm. right? Like the legacy lives with the people who carry it forward when you're gone. It's exactly. why we still talk about Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. right? And, and other leaders, uh, rest in peace, Colin Powell, as well as, well as other people we've lost it's because the people that they've influenced, now the decisions that they make, right, are predicated upon lessons that they learn from those folks. And so that's my ultimate goal. It's like to continue to create a situation where I can look around and say, hey, man, look at what we did. Look at what we did with just like a dream and some action and some planning. Mm -hmm. Look at what we did. So that's, that's my ultimate goal. Now, I love that answer. And there was something specific that you mentioned around leaving a legacy so that those that come after you can build upon it. Um, I named my company, Your Legacy Begins Now, 
simply because like we don't have to worry about we don't need to get caught up on what happened before where we are today we can surround ourselves with people like a dr mills and put the right information to our head so we can live our life of purpose because our legacy begins right now and there's this gentleman when i was working on my master's degree i was just hitting milestone after milestone breaking records and doing things that had never happened in that department Mm -hmm. before and he started he came under my under my mentorship while I was working on my master's, he was working on his bachelor's. So he'd follow me to various different speaking engagements that I had. He would always be like, B, I'm gonna be just like you, man. I'm like, no, don't be just like me. You be you, but the absolute best version. Yeah. So what would happen, eventually he started speaking. He started doing workshops. I remember he did, um, he was doing presentation, poster presentations initially. And I remember his very first presentation, he had his jitters came to me for a little bit of motivation before you had to present. And I'm like, first off, you got this, so you know it like the back of your hand. So shake it off, you know, go take a walk, get something to drink. You know, we gave him a little, a few critiques here and there. And later on in the day, they announced the winners. He took first place. So at the end of the event, we're breaking out, I'm helping break down the posters and such. He's like, man, I wonder where I'm gonna present this poster at next. Poster, uh uh-uh, you doing a workshop. You present an actual real presentation. So I spoke to a couple of his mentors or his advisors, and we pushed him to do just that. Nice. In less than a year's time, he was being pulled to Ole Miss, Florida State, Oklahoma, doing presentations in his lane. So I always tell him, like, look, man, take some of the things that you see in me. You pull whatever you need. You reformulate it into who you are and you go out and win in your area. And just so happened, I have um, back-to-back years. My first year and my second year, I was named student of the year for um, for the MSW program, two campus program. It was the first time the same person, uh, appreciate it. It was the first time that the same person won that award two consecutive years in the history of that school. So he hit me up about um, about four months or so ago. He just sent me a, a snapshot of his um, his certification, the certificate. He got the student of the year. And I said, I'm, wow. supposed, to be, I said, I'm supposed to be impressed. <laughs> I said, man, I expected nothing less. You know, then I gave him his kudos and everything. But there's like such a sense of pride when you know yeah. someone is following you and yeah. you're doing the right thing. And you know what? You don't have to be me, be like me, but be the best version of yourself. And I absolutely yeah. love what he's done because he's now the president of the Mississippi chapter of um, Black Lives Matter. Wow. So he's out here doing his thing. Okay. And what wow. you mentioned is so real. We have to be willing to pass that legacy to that next generation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's the thing, you know, this is not a competition. Mm-hmm. This is not a competition. This is an opportunity for mm-hmm. us to get it right and to help other folks get it right faster. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. You know, when you talked about being relevant and just, you know, in order for education to be relevant or education to be delivered um, and received, you know, it has to be relevant. It needs to be people got to learn how to build those relationships with their athletes, with their students. Um, And so you talked a lot about the relationships that you had with your coaches, the relationships that your teachers, everything was about relationships. And we have... um, from, from educators to students, we have somehow connected from the relationship part, right? So it's like, let's teach to the book. Let's teach to the test. We ain't got time to build no relationship. And so there's always a disconnect because the students are not interested in it because it's boring to them. But the, but the educators are feeling like you got to know this because I need you to pass this test, right? And so we always talk about how students and stuff is always looking. Even being an athletic coordinator, I'm always dressed up. And then my girls are always thinking, why don't you have on what the other coaches wear? I said, because I'm a woman first. So I teach them how to be a woman first when it's time to suit up and we suit up. But those things make your education relevant. So I want to talk about, I want you to speak on, now you've built these relationships with your students. Now these students look at you and they think, wow, Dr. Mills, I mean, that that's that dude, right? He's that dude. He's fly. He got on, you know, he got on J's. He got on whatever, right? <laughs> what about with your, with your educators? Because sometimes there's a disconnect with the vision that you have and sometimes the mission that they're on. They're there to check a box and you're there to create a legacy, right? Yeah. Um, 
talk about your delivery with your staff um, on how do you get people to buy into a system that we know is not always in our favor, right? Yep. So how do you how do you get your teachers or your educators or your your leaders who are under you to buy into your vision? Um, what is that conversation like, and and what and what are some of the things that you do to get them on board? I mean, so the ultimate goal with any adult, right? Because I think that adults come with their own mental models about how the world works, and because we come from different demographics, different races, different socioeconomic status, like everyone's experience is very likely different, and so. My thing is, I like to flatten your organization as much as I can, understanding that I have the authority to make decisions, but I am not above having these conversations with teachers about what they want to do, what their aspirations are, or even getting down and dirty and doing the professional development myself. I think that adults want to see that their leader is equally as skilled as they're asking them to be. And maybe I can't do it every day, but I will demonstrate that I'm capable. I will go and do the research that I need to, to do in order for you to see that I've done this work to understand just how heavy of a load you're carrying and that I care about you. So I'm constantly thinking about how can I ultimately take things off of your plate so that you can focus on the things that are most important. And that is educating the students and building relationships because your relationships is going to affect the attitude that they ultimately show you. And so I think that what I've gotten, no matter what the age bracket is, and you remember, I started administration, I was 25. The closest person in age to me in my department was 50. So you got to know that these people were like, listen, this guy, who is this kid? And so I would always say that for the 24 years of experience that someone has in the field, that I'm going to work 24 hours a day until I can catch up. And it was very important for me to always have not just an answer, but the right answer. And so the kind of barriers that begin to break down because my answers were right was like mind blowing. So that the person who was 60 years old could say, I can learn something from this kid. He's doing his homework and he gave me an answer seven times and he actually got it right. And right. so those kinds of things make people believe in your leadership. It make people believe in your vision because you're a walking model of what they could be. And I'm always right. open to having those conversations with my staff. So I don't know if anyone is on here watching that's a staff member of mine. I don't know if uh, someone right. uh, will see this later, but they'll tell you that you can literally come to me and have a conversation about whatever you want. And mm -hmm. I'll never be opposed to having that conversation because I understand no matter where you sit in the organization, from a cafeteria worker to a vice principal or principal, ultimately we're on the same team. And if Absolutely. we can be a team, then, then we, we won't score often because it's, it's going to lead to the detriment of the organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the key, you know, well, one of the reasons I always tell people, you know, us as black people are very powerful and we can really get some things moving and shaking. But the key is always consistency. And yeah. so that's one thing that people made from you. They know if they see Dr. Mills. He's always going to be consistent. He's going to be consistent with his vision. He's going to be consistent with his delivery. He's going to be consistent with what he believes is the truth. And so I think that's what we we need. Yeah. Um to be as leaders is somebody always knows what to expect when they come have a conversation with you. And so I appreciate you having that type of leadership skills. If you can speak on what you're currently doing right now, um, you know, if you have any books and, and stuff yeah. like that, also speak on that. But I want you to let us know if you have any events and just where you're at uh, right now in your space of leadership. And also if you could leave us with um, something that you would say to an educator, um, someone who's in the leadership role that's feeling like, I can't do this. You know, these kids are too much because we know that our kids deal with a lot of trauma. Yeah. We have trauma growing up as well, but I feel like the kids, this generation has so much trauma. I mean, you talked about even your mom, you being a single, uh, growing up in a single, um, yeah, single yeah, but 
you may not have seen as much. Your mom might have hid some things from you because she still provided for you. Whereas these kids today, they see it all. They know when they don't have it. They know they, they there's there's nothing hidden from them. So they really experience a lot of trauma. So if you can talk about that, but I really want you to speak on what you're currently doing right now, what, what kind of services you have to offer, um, and then also just speak to that educator or that leader who's who's in education feeling like this is just too much. Yep. So uh, what I what I'm doing right now, um, right now, so uh, I'm working with College of Chief Public Schools, and as I said, me and my partner we co-founded College of Chief Patterson. Uh, we have uh, a network which services three districts, and it's uh, Asbury Park, Plainfield, and then Patterson. So I'm the chief academic officer. Um, of that organization, and then of course the executive director of the Patterson campus. And so that work we service in about 3,000 students, and we're really uh, trying to move that mission and vision to reality, which is to get every student into and graduated from the top colleges in our country. Um, and the good news is, in many instances, that's come into fruition. Uh, we just received our ranking, our rating, our tiering. Uh, from the state of New Jersey yesterday in College of Patterson is actually a tier one school. And so there's three tiers. Tier three is the lowest. Tier one is the highest. And so to see the school go from one year being a tier, tier three in 17, 18 to now being a tier one um, during the pandemic is phenomenal. So everyone's excited about that. Um, so I would say that's my work in a traditional sense uh, that keeps me close to the research the responsibility that it, or, or the process that it's going to take to get students to and through. But uh, outside of that, I do have my own consultant company, of course, doing speaking engagements. I actually just got back from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Shout out to the uh, Alabama Association of School Boards. Um, they had me there. Um, that was a, a really good experience. Um, I have a book. Um, that really lays out for anyone who's interested in knowing how to turn around a poor performing school in 180 days, which is a recommendation that I would make to some administrators that's having struggles, buy that book and they call me and then we can figure stuff out. Where do they um, find the book at? Uh, they can go to jamarmills.store. So G-E-M-A-R mills.store. And um, they'll see that book and a plethora of other books. I have a partnership with Amazon, which uh, allows me to have an online bookstore. And so uh, my book is there. And then I also put out a children's book because what I realized in the wake of the pandemic and what was going on with George Floyd and it really being like the pinnacle of uh, things to address in our country, uh, I wrote a children's book called uh, different yet all the same. And it's a, it's all about racial bias and really teaching young students about what that dynamic is, what it means, why it's happening, and what they can do about it. Um, so that exists. Uh, I have a few other things I'm working on as far as events. I'm actually working on uh, a very black fireside chat is what it's called. Um, so that information will be out soon to share with the masses of anyone who wants to attend. It will be located um, in New Jersey, uh, and I guess I'll stop there. So, cause there's a lot of other stuff that's kind of, uh, <laughs> right, we gonna find everything we need to know about you on your website. You yeah, it's up there. It's up there and I'll keep sharing information, but I guess, uh, to an educator that is feeling, you know, defeated, um, I think that the first thing that they need to do is look within, reflect on things that they can do better and things that they are doing well. And secondly, they need to identify a mentor as well as a accountability partner, right? And there's a difference, right? There's a mentor who you can call and thought partner with and figure things out and like give you some motivation to inspire you to maybe get back in there for that week or that month. But then there's an accountability partner, right? Now this person is gonna say, you said, here's how you wanted to do these things. And so I'm gonna make sure that you do it the way you said it. 
And if it doesn't work, that we can think through the next thing you're going to establish as a goal, and then I can hold you accountable to that. So those are folks that helps you fight through the mud because we know success is not linear, right? It'll go up and down and around before it goes back up. And I think you need those kinds of people to really help you see how good you're going or how good you're doing, yet also uh, be able to tell you, hey, that wasn't a really good decision. Um, and I'll also add that take care of yourself, right? Like tomorrow is another day to fight the good fight. If you're watching this from your office, and when you leave, pack this stuff up and go home, spend time with your family. You got to make room for other things that satisfy you, Absolutely. that's going to refresh you and fulfill you Absolutely. so that you can get back in there and do the work for other people, Absolutely. you know, because you're going in here to do a service. Mm -hmm. And I think you got to understand that you need to actually fill your tank too. So I hope that those things are helpful because uh, I have a full on ritual with how I start my morning in order to be able to go for eight hours or 10 hours in a day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's it. And being very consistent. Consistency. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I mean, you can see it works when you're being consistent. Yeah. Nothing so, works without it. So I, I agree with that. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. We, we never give, sometimes we don't give um, our situation enough time to manifest because we're not consistent enough. So it's like, oh, this doesn't work. It's like, well, how long did you do it? <laughs> you yeah, know? exactly. You just do it once. <laughs> you yeah. might need to take a couple of times before it starts to work. Well, we truly appreciate um, you just being an honor and a blessing um, to have you on here. I wish you can have you on for hours. Um, but you are um, – such a powerful man. I know you've accomplished so many things um, on your journey right now, but I truly believe that you haven't even touched the surface of what's going um, to manifest into your future. And so I'm truly believe, and we are so honored to have you on the show um, because you, you know, what you see in your social media is totally different than having a conversation with somebody. And yeah, uh, yeah. to hear your story, you know, now it makes more sense when we see the scars and it makes more sense when we see the postings and we see you flying here and flying right. there. And so just continue to do what you do because you're doing it well. And we thank you for thank being you. a part of the Black Podcast. Yeah, and I appreciate yes, you all having me and hearing your stories. I mean, you all are doing amazing things too. I um, mean, I see what you're posting and what's happening now. I'm following you, brother, um, on Facebook. And if you're on Instagram, if I'm not following you, please hit me up there so I can do sure. that. So, um, again, like the goal is to, to pay it forward, to see other people do better than we are um, at, at earlier ages mm -hmm. um, so that they can do the same. I think that's how we build a groundswell of folks that are, are which we can then call a movement that shifts the trajectory of, of people of color, black people specifically in America, right? Like it's, we, we have to know that there's more ways than entertainment. Uh, we have to know that That's there's right. more benefits and ways of being exactly who they want to be outside of entertainment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we thank you for being that demonstration because it needs to be more of us to continue to demonstrate and be consistent in our demonstration. So I thank you for that. We will make sure that we will be uh, sending you an email very yep. soon on reconnecting on our organization and the programs that we have. And let's see how we can continue to build the legacy. So we want to thank you again for just being um, a blessing and taking the time to be on the Black Podcast. Thank you. You all have a great rest of your night. You too. Right. You do the same now. Take it easy. All right. Such a powerful man. Amazing, 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 amazing. And loves to pay forward. We like people that like to pay forward. We don't pay yeah. forward enough in our community. So we need to make sure that, you know, you don't just make it for you. You make it for everybody else. And so that's what life is about is who's the next person you can serve? Who's the next? What is the next thing that you can build for the next kid, for the next generation? And if you're not doing that, then how productive, what kind of life are we living if we're not able to pay it forward? That's why we're, we're giving these challenges and this knowledge and wisdom and all those things so that we can give it to somebody else. It's not just for you. So we have to make sure that 
doing something as simple as sharing the Black podcast. That's a way of contributing. That's a way of, of being a part of building a legacy is saying, I don't know who's in my circle that needs to hear this story. So I'm going to share this video, not just watch it for yourself. And that's it. But who are you sharing this wisdom with? Who are you sharing this knowledge with? That's how we grow and become a strong and productive community. So I really appreciate him continuing to take the time to grow and to um, not grow, not only grow in himself and his own professional development, but also to grow other students and build as he's doing it. I think it's amazing. I concur. <clears throat> Absolutely love it. Um, and just that relatability factor is just so important. Uh, so important because when they feel like we're talking over their head, they're not going to connect with us. If they don't connect with us, they're not going to listen to us. If they don't listen to us, they're not going to grasp what we're trying to pour into them. If they don't grasp what we're trying to pour into them. They're going to perpetuate a negative cycle of what happened the generation before them time and time and time again. So absolutely loving his work. Um, I've got to get that book. Anybody that works with schools, um, that works with low performing schools, I would recommend to grab his book, um, The Turnaround, to be able to have extra leg in the game. I think it's The Turnaround. Yeah, The Turnaround, 180 days of change. Have that yeah. extra leg up when you go in and pour into these schools. Um, thankfully, I was able to help turn around a school um, about five years ago. And looking at this book, I feel like I'll be able to help so many more schools uh, do something similar. But off of the note, guys, um, as mentioned before, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure to share this content. Um, be on the lookout from December. We'll actually have our podcast episodes via Spotify coming out to you. And um, we'll be sharing those uh, introductory advertisements, so to say, uh, before long. Because we're just trying to pour out information, guys. If you look at the acronym of our show, of black it's not just black because of the population <laughs> that we're serving we are boldly leveraging what is the bla boldly leveraging <laughs> absolutely connections for knowledge we are trying to connect with some of the most intellectually affluent some of the most financially affluent some of the most caringly affluent i made up that word but we really want to bring people. It sounds sound good. Uh, it sounds like a real word. Yes. We really <laughs> want to bring people across the spectrum of who we are. Greatness in so many different areas. Bring those people to you so you can take that information and change your situation. And off that note, this has been another episode. Thank you guys again. And you shall continue to see us. Continue to come back every Thursday. And we're going to be dropping dual action come December live podcast show plus Spotify podcast. Off that note, yeah, have a good one. Yes, indeed. Y'all take care now. <laughs>